tell me something like what brought you to the city and what brought you into show business and then how did that all unfold my family was all in show business my dad's family came from russia in 1890 and my grandmother in 1907 went into a Nickelodeon and said we're, they were going into the movie business, which was ridiculous because one of the boys was in the ice business, one of the boys was doing something else, somebody played an organ. And she said, no, we're going to go in the movie business. Fifteen years later, they had built 120 theaters in the Chicago area. Wow. And ten years after that, all their business was done with Paramount because there were, there were uh, you were able to have monopolies at that point. So Paramount, our, the Balaban and Katz theaters, which you probably noticed when you were in Chicago, the Chicago theater is one of them, and a lot of them are torn down by now. But, but the Balaban and Katz theaters only showed Paramount's mo movies, so Adolf Zucker became best friends with my uncle, Barney, who was the oldest brother and a really sweet and lovely man. But my dad Barney. was 24 years younger than his oldest brother, Barney. So Barney then becomes president of Paramount and the family still has the movie theaters and they all went, a lot of them became Republicans when they took away, when the, the monopolies weren't allowed to exist. They were so mad at Democrats, I think they thought for doing that. When I was 10, I broke my arm and I went to California and watched a movie being made and had a chair with my name on it and Sid Charisse hugged me. I had no idea who she was, but nonetheless, and I broke my arm. She wrote Sid Charisse on my cast. And it's like, if I had saved that, I would have the best <laughs> eBay item in the oh, world. Could you it imagine? would have been really smelly, but that's it. So I, <laughs> I, I thought because I was short and funny looking, I couldn't really do anything all that well. I can't really sing, I can't really act, or at least I couldn't, sometimes I can act now, but I really wasn't fit for anything. So I didn't plan to be an actor, but I sort of got to be an actor. Would you say that you might have spirituality rather than religion? Because you seem to me to be a very spiritual person. Um, Is that my crazy? Yes, yes, of course, of course. I don't really believe in God. You know, Sandra Bernhard believes in God. Okay, bless her for that, you know. And, you know, can I say something? The, the more I think about the fact that Sandra Bernhard believes in God, the more I tend to think maybe I have to believe in God now because she's so incredibly smart. Can you talk about your mom? Because, from because frankly, I have to admit it. I reread your memoir the other day, so I'm like fixated on things sure. from your memoir. One okay. of them is your relationship with your mother from the very, very earliest time. It was almost like she was molding you and feeding you so many. I'm sure there were difficult things too, but so many, so much of you as an adult oh, seemed yes. to come from your mother. Yes, I mean the thing about the relationship that I have with my whole upbringing my the school that i went to my family you know the one shining kind of star in the whole scenario is my mother she was like incredible she was funny and like um and erudite she read everything like my mother was such a reader she still is you know um she has this thing with my husband arnold who she loves by the way was that um, easy to happen um, yeah, I mean, by the time, no, yes, God, who knows the answer to that, right? But by now, she kind of adores that he takes care of me a little bit. You know, we had dinner one night after I had this terrible accident about 15 years ago, where I was in like, you know, traction, and I couldn't walk for a year. It was really scary. And we had dinner thereafter at Il Cantonori, my favorite restaurant on 10th Street, with Arnold and my mom. And she said to him, Darling, you are the best son-in-law. I can't believe you were so wonderful to my son. You took care of him. And you know if the shoe was on the other foot. And he said, yeah, yeah, let me stop you. I know. Best care money can buy, right? Because he knows <laughs> I'm not taking care of him. He knows that, right? So <laughs> that's a funny story, but that's true. She, she adores him. Am yeah, I right to think that fashion, from reading your book, seemed to be so much at the center of your life and designing? And as I'm talking to you now... Yes. I'm realizing that really is what is at the center of your life is being creative. And it's what yes. it takes to be creative. And, That's and, right. And it's not the same. So if I asked you about your first fashion show in Perry Ellis, you could talk about that, but that doesn't excite you. No, you know, it embarrasses me a tiny bit, right? Okay. That I actually put so much um, sort of uh, importance on such a crazy, um, 
such a crazy thing as fashion. It was what I was. It was my entire life, you know, for years. I really cared about the length of a skirt and the height of a heel and the way someone's eye makeup was applied. It really was my entire life. And it was a great thing, I think, for a person in his 20s and 30s, you know. But then to be saddled with that for the rest of your life, it's like, I don't care. You know, I'm sorry, I don't, you know. I love beautiful things and I love quality, but I think like, you know, are people too thin or too fat or too tall? I mean, is that really what we're doing? Do we really have to inflict those kind of ideals onto these kind of passe ideals onto people? You know, is that part I of the fun of, of QVC for you as you're getting to design yes. for real people? Part of the fun of QVC for me is that it's like, you know, just really good quality, I think incredibly accessible, you know, like most people can afford this stuff. And it's hilarious and so real, you know, that's part of the fun of it. Um, and, and, and so it's the opposite of like, you know, 20 editors going to 3000 shows in a matter of two weeks, right? And hating most of them and liking two of them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's the opposite of that, right? It's sort of like, oh, who cares? Just get a t-shirt because it's cute or get this little cashmere sweater because it's really cute and it's on sale. You know, like to me, that's what it should be about, right? You recreated I mean your life. You, you had one life and you, and I don't think you did it to figure out how to make more money. I think you did it to figure out a way that you would enjoy more and feel more fulfilled by. Money is not a good thing to be too obsessed with, I don't think. I mean, at least for me, I don't have the gift of that kind of, you know, like, you know, there are some men who go like, they touch something and it just is, it makes a fortune. And I was never really too good at that, you know? I was always kind of most, most concerned with what it was like to be in the room doing what I do and loving it or not liking it or being bored. Boredom, darling, boredom is the devil. Boredom is the worst thing in the world. I think boredom is like worse than anything. So, so I'm not, and I'm not kidding. Like I even, I even like people based on the fact, like I don't care if they're moral. I don't care if they're, you know, like, I don't care what they are. I just, as long as they're not boring, as long as they're like <laughs> interesting, I swear to God, I swear to God, you can cross me, you can, but as long as you're interesting at dinner, fine, we'll have dinner, you know? I if mean you could, that. If your older self could talk to your younger self, what would you what would you tell your younger self? Well, you know, here's what I would tell my younger self. I would say that even if you don't feel very secure in who you are or what you look like, really, because I think I think I never really felt too secure about what I looked like. And that held me back a great deal from doing what I really wanted to do, which was be on stage and be a performer. I always thought you had to be gorgeous to be that, right? Um, and so I always, I would want to tell my younger self that like that sort of thing doesn't matter. What matters is your conviction and your kind of enjoyment of whatever it is you're doing. And so like, I actually think persistence, persistence is what I would tell my younger self. Like keep at it, just stay at it for another second, you know? Well, you could almost look at your search for love to be somewhat involved in persistence and not giving up and you changing as you went along. Because how is it that you were able to find such a person that you found that you can be so happy with and imagine staying with forever and loving that way? Could you have ever done that as a younger person? No, no, I could not have done that. I mean, I would never have understood the the basis you know i would never understood what it meant and i'll tell you what kind of showed me what it, and i'm not kidding you my dog harry that i got in 2000 like i swear to you before i got that damn dog i didn't know what love was i just kind of was looking around thinking oh this is interesting flying every place and looking at everything and kind of having fun and then somehow harry just, it was this feeling that I had. And then weirdly, like, I don't know what it was. It was literally six months later, I met Arnold while I was walking the dog, which is so ironic. You know? It's not a mistake. No, no mistakes. No mistakes, darling. No mistakes. I feel as at home at the Jewish Center as you do. And that's saying a lot for the Jewish Center. I mean it. You know, like, I'm not kidding. When I die, I think I want my funeral to be there. Okay, just saying, I might want my funeral to be there. Well, <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'll, I'll see what I can do if I'm alive, which would be unlikely. Funeral to be.
<laughs> Thank you, Isaac. It was okay, great talking great. to you. Thank you, Bob. You're the best. I really you're enjoyed great. it.